we've got pant front, we have pant back, we have a pant yoke that creates shape. You have a waistband. The male pants almost always have a rectangular waistband because men typically are built like a rectangle and don't have a lot of curve in at the waist. Women, if your waistband is rectangular, you're gonna get little gaps on the side that you can put a couple of fingers in because it's not gonna sit as tight to your body. We can contour this and curve this if you need to. On the front, we have our inset pocket. This is called an inset pocket because we're setting it into the pants. An inseam pocket would be an elephant ear pocket like on pajama pants that sits right into the seam. When they turn inside out, they look like you've got big flappy elephant ears on the side. These pants do not have a patch pocket on the back just because I didn't want to install that in a half skill. But the pants patch pockets uh, examples are up on the bulletin board to show you how to miter your quarters, how to do your hems, and how to get the patch pocket ready to install. I also have a half scale pair of pants that have the welt pocket on the bum. I have a welt pocket example up here that I can show you. Um, I have another pair of half scale pants that also have the cargo on the side. So you can see all those different kinds of pants. With your pocket though, you have the pocket itself, which your pant front is cut out to accommodate. But on the inside, you have what's known as your pocket bag. This is what makes the pocket itself. I tend to use really flashy, sassy fabrics on my pocket bags, just because I can make a really sedate pair of pants and nobody knows that it's got flair except for me and people who know me really, really well, okay? I had a student put gold lame in his pocket bags once. That was awesome. These are little pink butterflies because why not, right? But I don't want a broken line in the front of the pants. I want them to look very businesslike on the outside. So I have a facing. The facing should be the same fabric as the, ins the outside of your pant pocket. You sew it onto your pocket bag. This helps you have an unbroken line, okay? On the zipper, you have a zipper extension, which is the return piece of fabric inside on the zipper. It's the piece that we sew the zipper to. You can see that it extends out beyond our zipper tape. It is the shape of your fly zipper stitching. It's just a little bigger than that. Helps give structure to the outside of the zipper to what the zipper tape is sewn to and we top stitch through. Okay, that's your zipper extension. And then on this side, we have our zipper shield. This is usually rectangular in nature. Sometimes it's angled down here at the bottom. Sometimes it's straight across. This is the piece that protects you from the zipper. If you have to choose one or the other to not put in, always put in the shield because there's nothing worse than accidental zippage. It's not cool. Okay, top stitching plan, that is dependent on the designer. Who is the designer? You are, not me. How about the inside of your pants? If we look at the inside of his pants, do I have any raw seams other than this one, which I left intentionally so you can see how the waistband is constructed? Is there anything unfinished on the inside? Okay, should yours have anything unfinished on the inside? Never, why? because you're professionals. You're training to be a professional. Would you want to purchase a pair of pants that was raggedy on the inside? That were gonna fall apart every time you put them in the washer and leave strings and threads everywhere? Now what happens if you want the unfinished bohemian hem on the bottom? A little Soho hem. What if you want that? Awesome. How are you going to stop it from unraveling and how are you going to finish it intentionally for a ragged hem? That needs to be a thought process that you're going through. Your pattern instructions may or may not have any examples, any instructions, any clear line on how to finish your seams on the inside. That is something that pattern makers usually leave off their pattern instructions. It may tell you to zigzag, it may tell you to finish your edges. That means the choice of finishing your edges is up to you. Back on the back wall, we have the physical glossary that you guys are so lucky that this year you did not start off your semester constructing that for me. 
The sad thing is, is now there's 10 seam finishes on that board that you do not have exposure to. Okay, whether it's a seam finish, a clean finish, a surged finish, a flat fell, a French seam, a welt seam, a narrow rolled seam, a self-bound seam, any of those kind of seam finishes, which is just what you're doing to the seam allowance on the inside to control that seam allowance, all of those things you do not have access and exposure to. So you can see how they look when they're finished, so you can make a choice. If it's a multi-step process, I have multi-step examples back there. I have the instructions for all of that, but you have to find me the resources. That is gonna be one of your final examples or one of your final assignments is you have to find me a digital resource for all of those skills because you're still turning in a glossary. You're just turning it in virtually. If you cannot find a digital resource for those skills, you will be making one yourself but that will be happening when we're not in class anymore. And it will be review at that point. So you need to be thinking about that. One of the reasons you have to think about that now is because there are two on that list that are constructed backwards. So a French seam and a flat fell seam, when you're sewing, traditionally, you sew right sides together and all your seam allowance happens on the inside of a garment. But if you're doing a flat fell, or a French seam, you start with wrong sides together and that first step of the seam construction all happens on the outside, which means my seam allowances would be out here, not next to my body. And it's backwards. It's not something that you can do after the fact. It has to be done as your first step. If you're doing a flat fell, especially in jeans, traditionally a flat fell gets done on the inseam. So if you want to do traditional flat fells on the end seam, you need to be thinking about that before you start your first construction process because it may make your instructions out of order. You may have to adjust how you sew things in. For example, on the Jutlands and the Jedediah pants, they tell you to do the fly zipper last, which means your end seam, your out seam, and all your pockets are already done before you put in that zipper. That is a lot of fabric to manipulate around. When I am doing construction, this is my preferred construction step. I like to do the inset pockets first. I like to do the zipper next, do the front inseam, then do the zipper, then start constructing fronts and backs together. But by doing that, I've taken flat fells off the table. They're no longer an option. Does that make sense? Now, can we fake it? Can we do a flat fell looks like a flat fell, but it's not a true flat fell? Yes, but just like in that video when she said there were places in those pants where she could feel the inseam against her skin and it was just a little rougher, a mock flat fell is gonna have that surging right against your skin. A true flat fell, all your seam allowance is on the outside of the pants, controlled on the outside of the pants, and inside next to your skin is a completely flat, smooth experience with no seam allowance, which is why it's traditionally on end seams, so you don't get that chafing. If you're doing any kind of a crotch gusset, flat fells are not your friend. You need to do something else because you're gonna be doing like a three-pointed Y seam and it complicates your construction process a little bit. So, <clears throat> you need to be thinking about those seam finishes and I would probably take a, a trip back there and just kind of see what they look like. They all have their own unique personality, their own unique look, and their own unique level of quality, which changes the experience of your upper and lower body projects. When you're doing your project, you also need to be thinking about your personal experience, your skill level, your time constraints, your machine constraints, and your material constraints. If you're using a 32 ounce denim, which is heavier than a Carhartt work pant, it's a heavier denim than that. It's really, really heavy. You're not gonna wanna do flat fells because then you're stitching through four layers of denim to try to top stitch. That's unwieldy. You're not gonna do a self-bound hem because that's trying to get your seam allowance into or a self-bound a self-bound seam finish, you're not gonna do that because that is wrapping your seam allowance into about a 16th of an inch space. It can't be done because your fabric itself has greater than that volume and thickness. Does that make sense? 
Uh, if you're using like a lightweight chamois or a chalet or an Oxford or a linen, uh, fraying is gonna be a problem. So you need to think about how you wanna finish that. Are you gonna serge it? Well, when you press it, that serging may imprint or brandish out to the outside. So that may not be the best way. You might wanna do a front seam. All of those kind of things will play into your decisions. But as a designer, those are your decisions. Don't let the pattern make it for you. Don't make me make it for you because they're yours. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of different pairs of pants up here for a second. These are the Jutlands. This is just an example of the Jutlands. As you can see, we had a couple of finishing issues in here on the inside. For me as an instructor, this is a critical failure. Would I buy this? I'd put it right back on the shelf and forget it. And then I'd probably never pick up this brand again. Okay, this raw edge right here is a problem for me. But if you don't finish this edge before you ever get started on the zipper, you're never gonna be able to touch it again. Because now it's secure, you can't finish it, you can't do anything with it. It should be done to start with, okay? They are a fully lined pair of pants, which is really lovely. It changes all the lines on your inside because then what seam finish do you use? Does it matter? because you've just hidden everything from the instructor's view. Okay, if you line it and line it well, it can hide a multitude of sins. And I will never know, because I can't access it once you've hemmed it, okay? Um, it does have a really roomy bum. It does have the inset pockets. She chose to put on the patch pockets, chose to do a little decorative top stitching on her pocket before she put her pockets in did a little contrast on her waistband, and she put in the cargo pockets. These cargo pockets have a box pleat to make them three-dimensional and have volume. You can also use a gusset. The green pepper uses a gusset. You can put snaps. She chose to put Velcro. So it just kind of depends on what you want. These, these, and these, are all the same pattern. This is the green pepper pant, made as the pattern says. I made no changes. This is the medium. It could fit me and two other people. It has a really low drop crotch. It also has a gusset that goes from ankle all the way through and down the other side. Its cargo pockets are freaking gigantic. And they also are double pocketed. Okay. The pockets on the back also are double pocketed. Patch pocket. Interior zipper pocket for security. <laughs> if you're choosing to do that, I highly recommend you pay attention. Uh, not to the Velcro. But to which direction your zipper pulls go. They should either go in opposite directions or in opposite directions, not both move left to right. <laughs> okay, little things. But this has got the best example, this pattern has got the best example of how to construct a fly zipper and how to get it clean than any other patterns back there. So if you need to be using instructions for the zipper from one and the pocket from another and the inseam from another, go ahead and do that. That's why I put all the instructions online. It has a little bit of elastic in the waistband if you're looking for a hiking pant, a mountaineering pant, a climbing pant. Um, these are really roomy and that's really great, but you may have to rebuild the crotch angle just a little. These are built for the zip-off shorts. So it has a zip-off. I just never could get motivated enough to finish the bottom of these really ugly pants. Uh, same pattern. They designed away the zip-offs. They changed the configuration of the pocket so it doesn't have the double and it's slightly smaller. Still put in the double in the back just because he wanted something secure. Okay, 
but he forgot to take into consideration that corduroy has nap and directionality. And so he was trying to save fabric, didn't quite have enough fabric and didn't think it mattered that he put his pockets on cutting them out upside down. And yet now we have two different light reflections between the pattern, the pocket and the pant. So it looks like we've used two different types of fabric when we didn't just these are on upside down in the layout stage. I told him to just own the mistake and pretend he did it on purpose. And then he has contrasting, right? Sometimes you can just say style change and figure out how to make the mistake work in your favor. Chose to contour the waistband a little bit, made it adjustable in the front with Velcro so he can tighten it up instead of putting in the elastic. I've had students put in an interior webbing belt with a buckle or um, alligator clips or D-rings, whatever, to try to get a little bit more structure. I've had students take it out completely because they didn't want it rubbing on their climbing harness and they wanted less of a friction point there. So it just depends. He also took out the crotch gusset and rebuilt the bottom of the pants. Oh, no, he didn't. He turned the crotch gusset oy, into a diamond. So he still gets the width in the crotch, but it only goes to knee. And then he stops and he took out all the extra down the rest of the legs so they weren't quite so full. If you're doing the green pepper and you choose to take out the crotch gusset completely, we have to rebuild your crotch because that pattern is now going to be missing four inches in crotch length. So we'll just have to rebuild. <clears throat> These are also the green pepper pants, but you can't tell who they belong to. <laughs> These would be mine because they're sassy. Okay. The green pepper does not have a side seam in them at all. The front and the back is all one piece. So it's a little different construction, but as a female who's curvy, that takes out one whole seam that I have available for an alteration to be able to put in changes to my hip line and my waistline. So I inserted a side seam so I had more sizing and alteration ability there. I did put the cargos on the side, but they're custom built cargos specifically for an iPhone 7 Plus with a pleat to make it three dimensional, asymmetrical pleat. It also has an interior pocket here, which is just big enough for a folded $20 bill and a driver's license. I didn't put the flaps on the back because I wanted it to be a little sleeker of a look, but I still do the patch pockets. I put in the rivets, it's just a decorative touch. I did a traditional inset jean pocket on the front. Um, I did just plain pocket bag because I was doing so much else to the rest. I doubled the width of my waistband and then contoured it so it's a little more shaped. You can see it's just wider and that it's curved this way instead of so square and rectangular at the top. And I took out the crotch gusset altogether and just rebuilt the pant. But this one, the corduroy and the black shorts are all using the same pattern. They've just been adjusted for the individual needs of whatever anybody needs. Does that make sense? Okay. I think we're good. 